you will gather from my accent, I'm Italian, there was no need to say. Um, so I'm going to talk about entropy and some, I'm a computational physicist and the techniques that we develop to um, compute entropy and I will explain to you why it is important to understand entropy. Imagine you were asked to count the number of buildings in New York City while flying over it for 20 minutes. Now this doesn't just seem a daunting task, it's probably impossible because the area to explore is too vast, the amount of time you're disposed of too little and you probably wouldn't be able to distinguish all of the buildings from the distance. This is the sort of problem that physicists have to face regularly and they generally provide an answer by making an estimate in view of some simple statistical arguments. So how should one proceed in this particular case? Well, you should take note of all the buildings that you see, uh, paying particular attention to the proportion. You should sketch them down. And then, knowing the size of one of them through the proportions, you can compute the volumes for all the buildings that you have observed. And you can histogram these volumes. And you will, you will obtain a distribution of this sort. Now, this distribution will be biased because when you're on a plane, you're much more likely to spot the large buildings, skyscrapers, than you are to spot small buildings, residential housing, even though you expect many more simple houses than skyscrapers. In fact, exceedingly many small buildings than large buildings. Therefore, we need to uh, unbiased the distribution and fit it to a Gaussian curve to remove the noise because we have a, a, a finite sample. And now the area under this unbiased distribution will roughly correspond to, to the total number of buildings in town. But why are we interested in developing techniques to enumerate things? Well, enumeration of the number of states for a physical system gives us direct access to a quantity known as entropy. Entropy is a measure of the amount of freedom or otherwise uncertainty in a physical system. And it's behind the second law of thermodynamics, which says that any spontaneous change in a closed system must lead to an increase in entropy, or in other words, heat must flow from hot to cold bodies. And this is a fundamental benchmark for all physical theories, including the ones that Kelvin talks about. And if a physical theory violates this law, then it must be wrong. And this has been taken quite seriously. Heinz London said that for the second law, it would burn at the stake. Now, when I define entropy, I say that it's the amount of freedom. And I stay away from the word disorder. Most of you have probably been taught in school that entropy is a measure of disorder rather than a measure of freedom. However, it turns out that our intuition for order doesn't correspond to what entropy actually is. So consider, for example, a system of hard spheres in a dense fluid state. If you let the system equilibrate, you'll find that it will spontaneously freeze and form a crystal, an ordered structure. Turns out that this structure here is entropically more favorable than the disordered ones. Now, generally, it is the case that disordered structures are entropically more favorable than ordered ones. But for this particular set of systems, where you have hard particles, they all interact when they touch each other, this is entropically more favorable than this because each particle can wiggle around their position and this freedom of wiggling gives them greater freedom than being in this sort of, uh, in this sort of structures. And this is called spontaneous ordering and it's a clear example of how important entropy is. Entropy can single-handedly determine the emerging behavior of a complex system even way beyond our intuition. It took the scientific community a very long time to accept this result. Now, a small side note about entropy, about this work. Numerical evidence for this groundbreaking work came out in 1957 from a paper by Bernie Alder and Tom Wainwright. And as you can see in this portrait, three people were involved. And Marianne Mensah, among the three, was the only one capable of writing a computer program. This was the first paper in which a technique known as molecular dynamics, and there is no department in any field that doesn't, scientific field that doesn't do molecular dynamics, she is missing from the list of authors. So I thought I should bring some justice to, to, this, uh, to this contribution. Anyway, let's come back to Cambridge. What do I actually do? Well, consider a system of three particles. For the set of all the possible configurations along this axis, we can compute the energy of the system. And we can expect two stable structures, a linear one and a triangular one. And therefore, we will have two minima in energy in this energy landscape. Well, what's the meaning of these wells? If we pick a point up here, which corresponds to this structure, we'll find that if we let the system relax, it will spontaneously go to the stable structure. And for this reason, each well is known as a basin of attraction. And it turns out that through some elaborate technique, we can compute the volume of a basin of attraction. And just as in, a, in, a, in, an, in our initial analogy, the volume of the basin 
is proportion to the probability that we're going to find it during our exploration of the energy landscape. Just as we were much more likely to spot large buildings than we were to spot small buildings. And therefore, by serving the energy landscape, which is the set of all possible configurations for the system, we can construct something very similar to the town landscape that we talked about at the beginning. And by using sim similar statistical arguments, we can count the total number of stable structures for, for this particular physical system. Now, you might be wondering, well, here, this is a, a very simple representation. What does a basin of attraction actually look like? Well, this is complicated because these are high dimensional spaces. And therefore, our intuition well, is, becomes useless. And turns out that this is an example of a basin of attraction for the three particle system that we described before. And this is an example of um, the amount of care that needs to be taken when uh, developing these techniques. In this particular case, we used two different minimization algorithms to find the minima in the energy landscape. And as you can see here, we have a lot of numerical instabilities, and therefore a lot of care must be taken when uh, developing these, uh, these algorithms. In terms of application, my particular interest lies in studying granular media uh, and glasses and computing the entropy, trying to extend some concept of statistical mechanics to systems that are out of equilibrium. And another direction of research which we would like to pursue is studying the string theory landscape and trying to use this enumeration technique to actually enumerate the total number of possible universes. Some of you have probably heard of the term multiverse. And we would like to apply the technique to this, uh, uh, to this problem. To conclude, I would like to thank the, my supervisor, Dan Frankel, who inspired this talk, Daniel and Fabien, who previously worked on the development of this method, and Julian and Jake, with whom I currently collaborate. Questions? Um, so this might actually just correspond to the building analogy not being perfect, and so yeah. let me know quickly if I'm sort of okay. overthinking this. Okay. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's when not you perfect. when you go to the in, when when you say when you when you made the analogy to the buildings, you say okay, you're more likely to see the big ones yeah, because right, you're looking right, from right. far away. But actually, we expect there to be a lot more of the smaller ones. Yeah. Um, that c my intuition tells me that doesn't exactly carry over. When you find the volume of the basin of attraction, mm -hmm. the volume should actually correspond to how many there are, correct? Which is not exactly the same as for the buildings, right? You see a bigger building that there are actually fewer well, of them. Uh, for a system like granular, granular media, where you can only find the minimum energy configuration, so it's literally this structure, this point here. You can only observe this point. And if you, if you move slightly the particles, they will spontaneously go back to this point. And therefore, measure, actually measuring the volume of this well, which is this sort of, if, as if you put harmonic springs on all the particles and they could oscillate around the, the center, if you measure by how much you can display something before you change completely the overall structure of the system, that, that volume actually is, is directly related to this idea of finding large buildings. It's, uh, it's right. Any more questions? Thanks for this talk. It was very, very interesting. My question is about the, and this will seem, seem unrelated at first, um, the economic downturn of the last few years and the <laughs> accusation that the economists we look to for uh, predictions about the state of the economy are often wrong but never uncertain and one of the one of the accusations uh, or, or explanations of why that happens is that um, economists have physics envy and that they've you know for the last well you know hundreds of years now tried to sort of scientify their their discipline by making it more like the the natural sciences and in particular speaking in the language of mathematics right. and so my question for you is in, in a math-heavy discipline, focused on complex systems, unpredictability, un uncertainty, I'm curious for your personal perspective as well as if you could kind of say maybe a bit of the general sense of your discipline, do your people think that this kind of math applies to social phenomena? Or is, is the human world or, or you know, social systems, are they complex in a different way? than the uh, sorts of complex 
stochastic phenomena that, that you're looking at? Yeah. Well, surely they, they, they do try and use the mathematical methods and, uh, and concept that we develop, uh, in particular in the field of networks. That's, that's something where a lot of physicists are going, trying to use what they know how to do and trying to apply it to the real world. But yeah, as, as you were saying, it's, it's extremely difficult due to the uh, level of uncertainty. And when, when you start talking of social uh, uh, science, it, it's extremely complicated because it's, it's, uh, the system is non-deterministic. It's, it's non-linear, it's chaotic. You know, as more perturbation in, the, in your initial condition can, can lead you to a completely different point. You know, it's like predicting what weather is going to be tomorrow. You know, in England, they've tried doing this for the last 200 years, they never managed to get the, the, the weather right, right? Uh, <laughs> so, yes, it's, it, it's very difficult, but uh, some, they, they often you can say something about the expected result. Uh, and uh, actually, this, this, this technique is, is one in, in this particular idea of, uh, of networks. You could have a system in which uh, uh, classical techniques tell you that uh, the system will be stable in a certain state. Okay? But this doesn't tell you anything. Uh, the fact that that point will be the lowest in energy in this order parameter that you develop for this network, this, which could be anything. It could be a neural network. You know, it could be literally anything. Uh, it could be an energy grid. Okay? Say you had to develop an energy grid. Uh, the fact that it's the lowest in energy doesn't tell you anything about the size of this well. In fact, if you look at this, this well is very low energy, but it's very thin, which means that any small perturbation will make you jump out of it. And so when we design something, we're not interested in finding this, but we are interested in finding this or this, which are still stable states, but much more stable with respect to, to large perturbations. Because we do know that in social science, large perturbations do happen. And that's what happened in the economical crisis in 2008. It was a big thing that happened, and no one had predicted for it. Because you know, their stability was actually stable only infinitesimally far from this point. But you know, big perturbation just made the jump straight out or where they thought they were, and, you know, and then anything happens. Thank you so much.